Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week. We talk with New Zealand activist Kevin Hester, and what an interview it is! Kevin gives his eyewitness report of watching the Greenpeace ship Rainbow Warrior after it was bombed and sunk in Auckland, New Zealand, killing one who was a friend of his. He talks about the direct link between climate change and nuclear, and we discuss what it takes to move to nuclear-free New Zealand. You will get both a laugh. And a chill out of the way he answers. Plus our regular numbnuts of the week: nuclear reactor duck and cover report, activist shoutouts, and more nuclear information than James Hansen wants COP 21 to know. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, December 8, 2015, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. The big news this week is the blatant way in which Bill Gates and a bunch of billionaires have been working on overdrive to convince the world that nuclear is the savior of climate change, which it is not. At the start of the COP 21 climate talks, Gates unveiled his Breakthrough Energy Coalition, which includes pro nuke billionaires Jeff Bezos of Amazon and Richard Branson of Virgin. These pseudo greenies say that they're going to be offering money to needy countries to put in sustainable energy sources, as long as those quote unquote sustainable sources include nuclear. The only thing that's sustainable of which is the waste, which lasts forever. We'll have more on COP 21 during our featured interview today and during the final thought. Here in the U.S. on Saturday, December 5th. There was an emergency shutdown at the Indian Point nuclear reactor, only 35 miles from Midtown Manhattan, after 10 control rods accidentally fell into the reactor core. Oops! According to the NRC, their own words, it was caused by a smoldering incident in the motor control center that supplies power to the rod control system. This is being monitored by an on-site fire brigade. According to a Westinghouse patent, the wording of which was dug up by ENEnews.com, a dropped rod will initially result in a reduction in the total power generated by the core. The reactor will then attempt to meet the load by increasing power in the remainder of the core, which could lead to local overheating elsewhere in the core. But of course, Nuclear Regulatory Commission spokesmodel and apologist Neil Sheehan said, "No." Immediate concerns were identified. Yeah, Neil, define immediate. There will be a demonstration to help shut down Indian Point on Saturday, December 12. To learn the details, contact Gary Shaw at Croton Shaw C R O T like Tom O N like Nancy Shaw at AOL dot com. In Colorado. An estimated 1,800 gallons of radioactive material leaked from Cotter Corporation's uranium bill near Cannon City, 115 miles south of Denver. There have been seven reports of similar spills at the mill over the past several years. In February of 2015, a broken pipe caused 20,000 gallons of uranium waste to leak. The mill is a Superfund site, but residents say it's not getting cleaned up fast enough. Where have we heard that one before? In a preview of what the people of North St. Louis, who are trying to get that radioactive waste cleaned up from the Westlake landfill, after 71 years, the federal government has decided that all nuclear waste from the World War II atomic bomb project should be removed from Lewiston, New York, a town that lies between the Erie and Ontario Great Lakes. The Army Corps of Engineers Fuzrap program is in charge, but does not expect the 490 million dollars required for removal of the waste 
to be available until 2022. Good news for those who worked at Rocky Flats, some 25 miles from Denver. If they have cancer, they no longer have to prove that it was work-related. It's just going to be assumed. Covered diseases include multiple myeloma and cancers of the brain, breast, colon, thyroid, and liver, among others. A pyrrhic victory at best. And in Virginia, a federal judge has dismissed a lawsuit that sought to overturn Virginia's uranium mining ban. An increased number of sites off the west west coast are showing, are showing signs of contamination from Fukushima. This includes the highest high detected level to date from a sample selected about 1,600 miles west of San Francisco. The level of radioactive cesium isotopes in the sample, 11 becquerels per cubic meter, is 50% higher than other samples located along the West Coast so far. The spread of radiation in North American waters is not isolated to a handful of locations, but can be detected along a stretch of more than 1,000 miles. And radiation levels outside of Fukushima Daiichi continue to spike. Perspective is offered by Mitsuehi Murata, the former Japanese ambassador to Switzerland, who states that Fukushima is now undeniably a global security issue. The unstoppable contamination of the Pacific Ocean and the atmosphere is seriously menacing the west coast of the United States. Some experts now estimate that the wave of radiation from Fukushima will be ten times bigger than all of the radiation from the entire world's nuclear tests throughout history combined. And at Fukushima, Japan's Nuclear Regulatory Authority announced that the dry casks that they have purchased to store spent fuel assemblies in may be excessively vulnerable. According to the agency, there's a possibility that an internal part of dry casks don't have enough strength. They were designed based on the standards of the Japan Society of Mechanical Engineers, a standard that was abolished this past October because it was found that it did not have enough basis and overrated the strength and thus became a scandal. Meanwhile, 11 of these casks are in actual use at Fukushima. So what are Japan's brightest industrial minds doing to clean up this mess? Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out of week. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, the company that designed and manufactured the failed steam generations that permanently shut down the San Onofre nuclear reactors in Southern California, have joined their pointy little heads with the Japan Atomic Power Company to create a power assist suit. The purpose of said suit is to help workers following a serious nuclear accident. The device enables workers to lift loads up to 40 kilograms or 88 pounds. Two things. They admit that the suit has been developed specifically for the nuclear industry. In other words, they are admitting that in the future they expect more serious nuclear accidents to take place which will require the use of this specialized gear in order to lift and clear debris wherever it occurs. So they're admitting it. Here's the other thing. The device enables workers to lift loads up to 40 kilograms. You know how much the device weighs? 39 kilograms. That's right, the workers are going to be schlepping around this thing on their backs that weighs 86 pounds in order to lift debris that weighs 88 pounds. Don't you just love the thinking of the nuclear industry? And that's why, this week, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries and Japan Atomic Power Company, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. Internationally, we go to Australia, where 25 tons of nuclear waste from France has been shipped for long-term storage. Australian authorities characterize the waste as of an intermediate level, things like gloves and protective clothing, but French authorities informed Greenpeace that this was high-level nuclear waste containing plutonium. Further, Australia chose to ship this waste on the BBC Shanghai, 
a ship with such blatant safety problems that the United States government has banned it from carrying any kind of governmental cargo at all. Australia does not have the capacity to reprocess this waste to make it safe for long-term storage, so they're just going to stick it somewhere for the time being. Just like everything else that gets done with nuclear waste all over the world. Canada has shipped a consignment of uranium to India, ending a 41-year-long ban in bilateral nuclear cooperation since Canada cried foul over India's first nuclear test in 1974. This is the latest blow to anti-nuclear activists in India. Two weeks ago on Nuclear Hot Seat, we heard from Kumar Sundaram, who has been working avidly to prevent the pending India-Japan nuclear deal. In support of his work, he reports that Mr. Katsutaka Itagawa, who was mayor of Fukushima when the nuclear accident happened in that town, has sent a message to the Indian people that reads in part. The Fukushima Daiichi disaster was the biggest nuclear accident in the world. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has tried to hide it while the worst was happening, and still Japan is trying to sell nuclear power plants to India and other countries. This is not acceptable. I am totally against the India-Japan nuclear power deal. And finally, this encouraging story out of South Korea. Koreans have long viewed nuclear power as an essential source of domestic energy, but had to face the fact that they had nowhere to put the radioactive waste. So the citizens of Seoul demonstrated an alternative to new nukes. In 2012, the city launched its One Less Nuclear Power Plant initiative, encouraging citizens to eliminate the need for a nuclear power plant by saving energy and generating renewable energy at home. Fourteen months later, and six months ahead of schedule. Seoul had cumulatively offset the equivalent of the annual capacity of one nuclear power plant, just over two million tons of oil equivalent. At the Paris Climate Conference, Park Woon Soon, mayor of Seoul, announced, "Seoul is ready to share with the world proof that local actions can achieve global vision. Citizens are the energy of Seoul." We'll have our featured interview in just a moment, but first. Merry Hanukkah, Christa, Kwanzaa, Solstice, Ramamas. It's the holiday time of year. Hanukkah, Christa, Qu- well, whatever belief you have or don't have, this time of year you're probably thinking about where to make a year-end donation to something you would like to support. Well, here we are. If you care about honest, vetted information on nuclear issues, make Nuclear Hot Seat one recipient of your holiday giving. Your donation will go far to support the work we do to bring you the most up-to-date, verifiable information on nuclear issues around the world. It's easy for you to donate. Just go to nuclearhotseat.com and click on the big red donate button. You can donate through PayPal or directly from your credit or debit card. And if you prefer not to donate online. Email info at nuclearhotseat dot com for a snail mail address where you can send your donation the old-fashioned way, and know that whatever you can do to help support our work as we go into twenty sixteen, deep gratitude and many thanks. Kevin Hester was born in New Zealand and became involved in the early nineteen eighties in that country's environmental movement, which was heavily influenced by the anti-nuclear activities that resulted in having New Zealand declared nuclear free. Kevin was once arrested with Peter Wilcox, the skipper of the Greenpeace Rainbow Warrior, and charged with obstructing a nuclear ship in the course of its passage, something of which he is very proud. In recent years. Most of Kevin's waking hours are spent either enjoying the ocean and natural habitat as he watches the biosphere unraveling from within, or researching online as he endeavors to warn us all about the imminent dangers of climate change. Kevin Hester, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you and your listeners today, Libby. Let's start out with exploring New Zealand's status as a nuclear-free country. Since 1984, 
nuclear-powered or nuclear-armed ships have been banned from using New Zealand ports or entering New Zealand waters. And since 1987, territorial sea, land, and airspace of New Zealand have become nuclear-free zones. How did such a thing come about, and what exactly does it mean? The nuclear issue always had a lot of impetuous and, and a lot of support in New Zealand. We're a marine nation, and I think we've got the highest number of privately owned boats of any country in the world because we're, we're a massive series of islands. People have a, a bit of a misconception about New Zealand that it's a small place. We have a small population, but it's an incredibly big country, and the territorial waters around New Zealand are huge. And the whole basis of the New Zealand economy and the biosphere revolves around the ocean. So they're incredibly important to us as as a nation. Yet, considering that it's a nuclear-free nation, contrary to general understanding, New Zealand's Nuclear Free Zone Act does not prohibit nuclear power plants, nor does it prevent nuclear research facilities, the use of radioactive isotopes, or other land-based nuclear activities. Is this a contradiction? Is there a nuclear lobby involved with this? An exception was probably made for using various radionuclides for medical purposes, which is done pretty much everywhere. So I assume that that's why that, that was left open. I suspect that the corporations who own us, and I always refer to it as that because the corporations pretty much own all of us, have managed to keep that window open. So there is the chance that a future government or even the lunatic one that we have now could propose that we would uh, have nuclear power in New Zealand. It's absolute lunacy, but it would be something that we would could easily have to confront, especially now that at COP21 in Paris, the climate change negotiations, the nuclear industry has been preparing for it for a very long time, and they are trying to spruik themselves as a solution to climate change. It's absolutely nuts. You know, Albert Einstein said if the answer to a question is nuclear, it has to be an incredibly stupid question. We'll talk about COP21 in a little while. But sticking with New Zealand, because those of us, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, what we know about you comes from, what was it, the Lord of the Rings movies? (laughs) Yes. So let's get this real. The country won't allow anything nuclear into its waters and any of its territories, yet there is this possibility that there can be nuclear power plants. And here you are as quite a well-known, certainly to social media, anti-nuclear activist. Does New Zealand have any kind of anti-nuclear movement? And if so, how could that be given birth to, given the history of the country? I think a lot of the anti-nuclear movement evolved out of the early Greenpeace and Rainbow Warrior days. We had atmospheric nuclear testing in French Polynesia. And then, of course, the lunatics started drilling down into Muir Atoll and doing detonations underneath the atoll. I don't know if anyone knows this. Not many people know about it, but there was one nuclear test that they were doing where they drilled a hole way down deep underneath the atoll at Muir And as they were inserting the device, it jammed. And rather than remove the device, they detonated it high up. And it is fractured. A segment of Muraroa, a whole section of the atoll, has broken off. And I had some very good intel from some friends of mine who were working on Auckland Port last year. And they told me, they, they, <laughs> they came to track me down and said, Hester, there's a huge quantities of cement, way more than is normal getting shipped out of New Zealand. And it's heading up to French Polynesia. And the word is, is that it's going to do some kind of damage control at Muraroa. I spoke to Helen Caldicott about this. And she said to me that she knew about the, the detonation that had fractured the reef, but she didn't know any more about what's happening up there. But the waters around Muraroa are so, so heavily policed. If you're a journalist and you go up there and hardly any ever do anymore, but in the old days, they used to get searched to make sure that no one was bringing any coral back from up there where it would be able to be analysed and see what kind of radionuclides were in it. Situation, as always, is infinitely worse than we're being told. For clarity's sake, for those of us not familiar, 
who is the they that you are referring to and how far away is this atoll from New Zealand? The they that I talk about is the military industrial complex. One thing I'd really like to emphasize about nuclear power is that nuclear power is a byproduct of the nuclear weapons industry. The nuclear power stations were used for enriching the uranium as part of the process of making weapons grade uranium and plutonium. So I think it's really important to remember that it's part of that military industrial complex. And I think they're the people who are trying to keep the industry alive for a variety of reasons. You know, they're, they're, they're sociopathic psychopaths. They're the worst of the worst, these people. But Muro is a very long way away from New Zealand. It's not an immediate threat to us because it's in the northern hemisphere and the ocean currents don't circulate to the south in the same way. But obviously, anything that goes into the Pacific is an extremely bad situation for all of us. If people have an ecological movement association with New Zealand. It's usually the fact that the Greenpeace ship, the Rainbow Warrior, was bombed while it was in New Zealand. This is back in 1985. And that photographer, Fernando Pereira, was killed while on board. What can you tell us about what led up to the Rainbow Warrior bombing and what happened after that? I stood on the wharf the night that the rainbow was blown up and I stood and cried watching her hanging on the side of the wharf drowning and knowing that Fernando was down below and, and had been murdered. And it's really important to remember that, that Fernando was murdered. The French have tried to, to say that it was that they had never meant to hurt anyone, but there were two bombs exploded on the hull of the warrior that night, a large one and a smaller one. And they were timed. There was a few minutes between when one bomb went off and when the other went off. And, After the first bombing, Fernando went down below to his cabin to rescue his photographic equipment because he was the photographer on the warrior. And uh, the second bomb detonated. It killed or knocked him out. And I think it knocked him out and Fernando drowned. But a really important detail that's much understated about the situation was that Walter Linney, who was the prime minister of Vanuatu, he had sent down a government representative who was travelling on the warrior at the time, his name was Charles Rara, and Charles had a diplomatic passport. And a lot of us believe that it was an assassination attempt on Charles. Charles later died from cancer, and I, I, I suspect there was something to do with the atmospheric testing that had taken place up in the Pacific. But I really think it's important to remember that there was no warning that night for those bombs and it was a really sophisticated attack that was launched on the on the warrior there were probably two dozen people involved in setting up the whole operation greenpeace was heavily infiltrated by agents they sent a a ship called the ovia that came down from new caledonia that had the inflatable boat that they'd built and bought in london and the bombs that they used And there was a large, a very large number of agents operating in Auckland. Some of the agents went up, hired camper vans and went to the Bay of Islands and to the north of New Zealand and made a a rendezvous with the the agents who had brought the weapons from um, New Caledonia. And it was that, that was the place where the whole plot unraveled because people had noticed them acting strangely and ma- had made notes of it. It was a really wonderful piece of uh, community policing that led to the capture of Dominique Prieur and Alain Mafar, the two people who murdered my comrade Fernando and literally got away with it. And that goes back to something you and I had talked before about David Longy, the New Zealand Prime Minister, and my somewhat heated altercation that I had with him. Dominique Peru and Elaine Marfat, were they operating by themselves or were they part of some larger plot or were they sent by some entity? They were sent by the French Secret Service, the DGSE, on the authority of Charles Hernou, who was the, the minister in charge. And right to the very top, Mitterrand knew that this operation was taking place. This is state-sanctioned terrorism that happened in New Zealand, sanctioned by, from the very top of the French government. They came down with this big troop of people, and they were DGSE agents, Secret Service agents. 
we caught them. It was incredible. We caught them. But what happened after that is that an enormous amount of pressure was put on David Longy, the New Zealand Prime Minister, uh, to free those two agents. David Longy was the Prime Minister, and my mother was David's electorate secretary. So he, she looked after his office and his little electorate, or in his electorate in Auckland. And David was a regular visitor at our house. And I went round there only a few days after he had allowed Dominique Prieur and Alain Mafat, who had been sentenced to 10 years, I think, in jail in New Zealand, he gave them a pardon and let them go. And they went to Hau Atoll, another French Polynesian island, paradise. Instead of doing time for murdering Fernando in a New Zealand jail, they were on a, a beautiful paradise island in the Pacific, where Dominique Prieur succeeded in getting herself pregnant very quickly. So it was all very convenient. And I went around to mum and dad's and I saw David there and I got talking and I was young and angry and felt that we'd really been really hard done by that these two murderers, terrorist murderers, that we'd convicted in a court of law were going to be free. And David said to me, and I remember him pointing his fingers to Paul, and he said, Kevin, the French have a gun to our heads, and they've already proven they will pull the trigger. We have to let them go or they will crash our economy. And that's what the French had said. They would stop all of our dairy products and, and meat and uh, being imported into France and into the European community. So it was, it was state terrorism and then a threat of state sanctions against us for convicting their terrorists. That falls into alignment with a story a friend of mine from New Zealand told me that when New Zealand first went nuclear-free, a United States Navy ship was attempting to dock in the country and was turned away because it was nuclear powered. And the U.S. did not take kindly to this because New Zealand was this little pipsqueak country standing up to the mighty United States. So what they did was they put a 500 percent tariff on lamb, which remains to this day, which is why two small lamb chops from New Zealand cost about twenty dollars. It's clean, but it's expensive. And that was their form of retaliation at a very low level. At about the same time as the Rainbow Warrior tragedy took place, New Zealand Prime Minister David Longy was engaged in a debate on nuclear at the Oxford Union in England, and he was debating against nuclear. Tell us a bit about that debate and the lovely quote that came from it. It was really, really quite wonderful. David was a, a real orator. He was a solicitor by profession, and he was a really wonderful speaker. And he leaned forward and he said, and I'm going to give it to you if you hold your breath just for a moment. I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards me. And that was the pro-nuclear crowd that he was saying that to. Yes, yes. It was, it was a classic David Longy line. Now, was David Longy always anti-nuclear or did something happen to pivot him? I'm trying to get a sense of the history here in New Zealand as to how the country became so remarkably and legally anti-nuclear. I believe in the early days, David wasn't convinced about it, but he was a populist in many respects. And what, what he did see and, and did identify with was that it really had a groundswell of popular support that transcended the normal left-right paradigm. And this is a, an issue that us environmentalists have to remember is that quite often th there can be people in conservative governments that are opposed to a whole lot of these things as well. And we need to identify those things and somehow or other win those people over and transcend the left-right paradigm. So we're having this great conversation with you, but I find myself wondering, what is your background? What led you to the anti-nuclear movement? And what is it that keeps you working on it as intensely and as articulately as you have been? I've completed 16 ocean passages on yachts, mostly in the Pacific, but I, I've sailed the length of the Mediterranean and I've sailed down the coast of Africa and the Indian Ocean as well. Is this as a crew member? Were you fishing? What was the purpose behind these journeys? I was the skipper and I was a delivery skipper on yachts. So I wasn't fishing at all. Well, I, mean, I was fishing casually, but no, not commercially. But the only commercial component was that I did 
for a job, I delivered yachts. It wasn't a bad job. (laughs) (laughs) I've heard of a lot worse than that. So as you are crossing the ocean this many times, what was it that started to occur to you? What nagged at you about the nuclear issue in particular? There's a classic myth about nuclear and their oceans where the solution to pollution was dilution. This is something that us anti-nuclear activists had forced down our throats since probably 1950 when they started throwing their rubbish in the ocean. But it's completely untrue. One of the huge problems, one of the many huge problems with nuclear is that radionuclides bioaccumulate in the food chain. The many different forms of phytoplankton and plankton absorb radionuclides and then they're at the bottom of the food chain and they are continually sent up the food chain so the top predators and this is a really big lesson for humans because we're top predators the top predators are the ones that are the final repository for all of these radionuclides so it's an, a massive issue if you have any respect for a the biosphere and the rest of the human beings that are going to be coming along after us, we have to show some respect and some restraint on this ridiculous industry. And how did you start to become active in what one could call the movement? I was very young when it first started. And I I think that how I came to it was I saw this courageous activism from all sorts of different people. And I just wanted to be a part of it. So it was about good leaders. I, I was lucky I had good activist leaders when I was a young bo- a young man. And, you know, like a lot of young people, I had the anger in my heart. And it was a really good way for me to, not in my heart, but I had anger, you know, like lots of young males do. And it was a really good way for me to deal with my anger. We could go out on those, on our little boats and yell and scream at the nuclear ships coming in and get ourselves between them. It was a really satisfying thing. And when you would get between the ships and where they were trying to go, this was before New Zealand declared itself as an anti-nuclear country, correct? Yes, absolutely. I was once arrested with Peter Wilcox, who was the skipper of the Rainbow Warrior. I wasn't on the Warrior. I was on my own little boat or my friend's little boat. And we were out blockading the harbour. And we used to do these blockades where we would try and and make it impossible for them to get into the inner harbour. And I managed to get our little boat between this warship and the wharf. And the police came, and it was running on a little wooden boat. And the police came alongside and they were yelling at me to turn the boat around and get out. And I just ignored them. And then they put a hank, a rope on one of my stays and tried to pull us with their police inflatable. And the hank quickly slid to the top of the mast and pulled the boat over on its side and capsized us, which made their problem even bigger because now they had a capsized yacht between the warship and the wharf. That made It, it served its purpose. It held the, the whole process up even longer. So then I'm floating around in the harbour, still mouthing off at the warship. And the police dragged me out onto the Deodar, which is the New Zealand police patrol boat at the time. And they handcuffed me on the bow. And they were quite busy, obviously, because there were people in the water and a boat and a warship. It was quite a complex situation. So while they weren't looking, I jumped overboard. And I admit, I didn't give it a great deal of thought. And to think that it, how hard it is to dog paddle with your hang, hands handcuffed behind your back. <laughs> so I'm gasping for breath. And fortunately, they came and dragged me out of the water for a second time. And this time they handcuffed me to the safety rail on their boat. I said to them when they handcuffed me, I said, you don't need to do that. I'm not going to jump again. <laughs> but um, they thought it was wiser just to tie me up. So going back to the bioaccumulation issue, and I agree, as I have learned, you cannot dilute radionuclides. You can only disperse them. Given that Fukushima Daiichi happened a little over four and a half years ago, what is your take on what it is doing to the ocean? And what do you want to bring to our awareness about this? There's a number of issues that I'd like to talk about with regard to Fukushima Daiichi. First of all, we hear all the time about three or 400 tonnes of radioactive water that's entering the Pacific for the last 1,600 plus days, 24-7. 
That is no doubt true and no doubt an understatement of how much water is going into the Pacific. The six plants at Fukushima Daiichi, three of them have got meltdowns and melt-throughs where it's gone through primary and secondary containment. That those plants were built on a dry riverbed, and it was dry on the surface, but those dry riverbeds always have arterial water flowing underneath. So there's a mountain, there's an absolutely beautiful mountain range above Fukushima Daiichi, and a lot of that water is running down in, art, in artesian waterways beneath those plants. So that will be flowing over those three coriums that have escaped containment and running into the Pacific all the time. So yes, that is a very big issue. But there is a bigger issue than that that no one talks about. There are three coriums, what used to be called cores, but until they melt down, they become a corium. There are three cores that are exposed to the atmosphere. There is an enormous amount of radionuclides going into the atmosphere above that plant and being carried around the entire northern hemisphere. And every time it rains, it's raining radionuclides. So they're raining into the Pacific and they're raining into all of the coastal regions around the Pacific. For your listeners, I really like them to always remember that don't just think about the water. Even though the water is critically important, there is more radionuclides probably going into the atmosphere than going into the Pacific. This brings us to COP21, the climate change summit that's taking place as we speak in Paris. I've talked about this elsewhere in the program, but what do you think about the current propaganda campaign at COP21 that's trying to turn the disaster that is nuclear into the savior of the climate change catastrophe? It's a classic indication of how dystopian our lifestyles have become when we're in such deep and utter trouble with abrupt climate change that they're looking for a lunatic solution like nuclear power. And it really does show how far these nutcases will go to sell their business model. The fact that they think that they can sell nuclear to us as a solution to climate change shows how arrogant they are and the hubris of these people. It's an extraordinary. It has struck me as a brilliant piece of evil social engineering, how well they have planted their stories, planted their propaganda, even placed people in climate marches literally around the globe, all of them wearing very preppy, neat clothing and having very neatly printed out signs dealing with, oh, nuclear is really the answer. And the propaganda keeps growing to the point where most of the news stories that I've heard that acknowledge nuclear at all in connection with COP21 is talking about the fact, well, we really do have to think about this, as opposed to saying, no, the story is the propaganda campaign that has been planned out with talking points and is well-funded and well-greased that is trying to convince the world to act in its own worst interests. Absolutely. I think most of your, your listeners will know that there's been a huge expose in recent months about Exxon Mobil, where Exxon knew that their product was incinerating the biosphere decades ago, right back in the 80s, they knew about it. And they covered it up and they put out a disinformation campaign to spruik their product. Well, the nuclear industry is doing the same thing. This is, they see this as an opportunity, a business opportunity. So many of these corporations deal with all of these situations in exactly the same way. And one thing I think we should talk about, we talk about how bad it is for humans, the situation, but we're losing 150 to 200 species a day as a result of abrupt climate change. And that is accelerating. It's, it's, it's the... It's the fastest loss of species in, that's been happening on this planet for millions of years. It's, it's extraordinary. I would like us to start being a little less human-centric about this issue. And it's a real reason why I, I was really so glad to talk about the, the convergence between climate change and nuclear. Because we are not going to get out of this paradox that we're confronted with. It's going to wipe out most life on the planet sooner or later, depending on how 
what time frames anyone looks at. If we were going to do anything positive going forward for this planet as a species, it would be to decommission every nuclear power plant that exists on this planet before we go extinct. Because there's been five previous extinction events on this planet. And the planet came back each time afterwards. When this extinction, the sixth great extinction, takes place, one thing is going to be different from all the others. It means there's going to be one form of pollution left behind by one species that changes the next iteration on this planet, and that is nuclear. It is completely and utterly shameful. What do I ask after that? Uh, <laughs> you're very good. That was, that, was, that was good. So with your awareness, your background, your self-education on all of this, where do you see the best place to put your activism moving forward? I have a couple of different strains that are important to me. I think we need to treat this whole situation as an, an emergency that it's not being treated with at the moment. I think we should have a form of Marshall Plan that was instigated after the Second World War to get the world back on its feet. What I would do is I would say we shouldn't build another car on this planet, which is what happened in the United States. They stopped building cars halfway through the war and put all their energy into building, sadly, munitions and weaponry. But we, we should have a global Marshall Plan to try and slow down the Armageddon of abrupt climate change as quickly as we could. And we could get into a situation where we disengage every – I'd do the opposite of what these nuclear spruks want. We'd disengage every nuclear plant from the grid right now and get into emergency shutdown of them and get as much of the spent fuel into dry cast containers. One of the things that people don't realise about the nuclear industry – all these 430-odd nuclear power stations that I know of, there will be many more, I'm sure, they have spent fuel pools. And in those spent fuel pools is infinitely more fuel than is in the reactors. And instead of them dealing with that fuel, they've just taken it out and stuck it in these swimming pools, most of them on the Mark II reactors that they have at, at Fukushima Daiichi. The pools are 60 feet off the ground, for goodness sake. 60 feet off the ground on a highly seismically active island chain. It's just nuts. What I would be saying is let's get that fuel into dry cast containers. At least let's get it on the ground. Let's start planning for the worst and following the precautionary principle. But that's just not being done. It's business as usual. Cowboy capitalism just racing on, protecting their share price for a week and a month and a year, not concerned about two years from now let alone the genetic downlight of themselves and their whole families. I've got a little line on that. People often say to me, how can these people sleep at night? But I've got a theory on capitalism where I believe that the people who get to the very top and do the best in the cowboy capitalism we have now are a mixture of sociopaths and psychopaths, and they lack empathy. It's easier for you to, to run a corporation if you're not an empath because then you can make radical decisions that affect huge numbers of people and make them and not lose any sleep over it. The normal human beings, healthy human beings, would have trouble with a lot of these issues. And I believe that's why you know, we look at them and we go, how can they sleep at night? How can they sleep at night? The reason they can sleep is they completely and utterly lack empathy. So what do you see as the next steps in New Zealand to bring about change, be it on climate change or on nuclear or the combination of the two? I spend my life pretty much full time on the climate change issue. That's what I do now. Last year, I brought a, a friend of mine, Professor Guy McPherson, New to New Zealand, and we travelled the country speaking about abrupt climate change and about the nuclear issue and about the fact that there are going to be millions and millions of climate change refugees, billions, in fact, looking for some place to go on the planet. Because of New Zealand's location in the southern hemisphere, in the bottom of the southern hemisphere, we will be one of the last habitable places on Earth, which means that we have a target on our forehead for being invaded by one of the superpowers. What I spend most of my time doing is trying to wake up young people 
and make them aware of how bad this and dire the situation is going forward. And I would love them to get into professions like permaculture and trades and not go into charismatic professions that people are, are all looking at with IT and things like that. I think we're going to have to get prepared for a society that doesn't involve industrial civilization. And that will only be for a short period of time because when we have collapse of industrial civilization, we also have 430 nuclear power station meltdowns. We have 1,200 spent fuel pool fires. It is beyond comprehension how bad it will be. And life on this planet will be taken out very quickly. But there will be a time when people will need to be resilient. And I would like young people to get ready and build resilience in, amongst themselves and in their communities. So given that there are many steps that we can take, and I do my best on Nuclear Hot Seat to point out solutions and actions that we can all take. I'm wondering as an important step, can you fill us in on New Zealand immigration policy and what it would take to get there before things go south? Yes, you just have to have millions of dollars. It's the same old story. New Zealand, my country is a disgrace. We have an enormous refugee problem on the planet at the moment. And New Zealand has never fulfilled its obligations under the United Nations conventions of taking the accepted number of refugees that we agreed to and signed up to. But if you have truckloads of money, irrespective of your criminal history, you can buy your way into New Zealand. We've had lots of cases of people who have criminal convictions, but tanks of money coming here and setting up businesses. Unfortunately, a whole lot of the stories that people have heard about New Zealand being clean and green and progressive, a lot of that now is, is history. We have a, a really terrible conservative government run by a banker, a former Wall Street banker. How on earth did we allow that to happen? So in other words, I should really put my immigration to New Zealand plans on hold until I've managed to rustle up a couple of million dollars. And get in the queue with all of the other thousands of millionaires and billionaires that are pouring in here. There's a lot of uber wealthy people coming here and buying up big stations, and uh, uh, sheep stations, and charismatic properties all over the place. The migration of the uber wealthy who are running away from all these problems is underway. If listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat can help support you, your vision, the work that you are doing, what would you ask us to do? I would like you to use social media as much as you can for productive reasons. I'd like to share these kinds of interviews that we're having today and any information that you can about about climate change and the, the, the confluence of nuclear with it and put it out into as many diverse groups as possible. If you have any kind of religious belief, take it to your church. If you're involved in any community actions, take it to your communities and join the dots. It's really important to join the dots between all these things. Climate change and nuclear are intrinsically linked. Join the dots. Show the danger. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us at this time? The abrupt climate change issue that we're confronted with is vastly worse than anybody is being told. So what I would want everyone to do is just try and remember that there is no guarantee of the normal time frames that all the generations between us have been operating on. I want everyone to go out and make the most of their lives, to love the ones they love, and to think about the 150 or 200 species that are going extinct every day. Kevin, you've always struck me as a profound thinker when I have read your posts online on the various nuclear sites and we've been pursuing this for a while to get you on the show. You've given us a lot to think about. And I want to thank you so much for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. It's been my absolute pleasure to be here. That was New Zealand climate change and anti-nuclear activist Kevin Hester. Make sure you friend Kevin on Facebook to get his articulate, perceptive updates, as well as periodic infusions of what he likes to call Doomer humor. Here's this week's radiation safeguarding tip from Wrapped, Radiation Awareness Protection Talk. 
There have been reports in the past weeks of high levels of cesium contamination found in Japanese mushrooms grown near Fukushima. Mushrooms are natural bioaccumulators of radiation. It's been proposed that they might even be used in remediation efforts. But that means you don't have to be living near Fukushima to run the risk of being hit with radionuclides in your mushrooms because that's the first food crop that will show contamination. So you might want to consider avoiding mushrooms in your diet, and especially any that come from Japan. Want more information on best practices to help safeguard from radiation? Radiation Awareness Protection Talk, or RAPT, is a six-audio compilation of vetted, footnoted, verifiable information on how to best take care of yourself and your loved ones when facing a nuclear crisis. To learn more, go to raptawareness.com. That's R-A-P like Peter, T like Tom, awareness.com. We have a free report available for you there, more information on radiation and health, and you can just cut to the chase and get the full program. That's raptawareness.com. Activist shout-outs. It's official! The International Uranium Film Festival is coming to Hollywood in 2016. Now in its sixth year, the International Uranium Film Festival is an annual celebration honoring films tackling a difficult but globally important set of issues. Atomic power, radioactivity, and nuclear accidents. From Hiroshima to Fukushima, from uranium mining to nuclear waste, that's the shovel in the ground, to the pile of radioactive debris nobody knows what to do with. From Three Mile Island to Chernobyl to Fukushima to who knows where the next one's going to happen. The IUFF gives its Yellow Oscar, its top award, to Best Feature Documentary, Best Short Documentary, Best Fiction, Best Short Fiction, and Best Animation. The regular deadline for submissions is December 31st, 2015, and the final deadline is January 31st, 2016. So if your films aren't together yet, edit, edit, edit. As I said, the annual festival will take place in March this year in Los Angeles, in Hollywood, at the Egyptian Theater. It will also take place in May in Rio de Janeiro and in September in Berlin. So calling all filmmakers, submission of your films is free, and you can learn more by going to uraniumfilmfestival.org. You can also join with them on Facebook. And yes, Nuclear Hot Seat has been deeply involved in helping to bring the festival to the heart of Tinseltown, and we will be keeping you up to date with all the stories as we lead up to the events March 24th through 28th in Los Angeles. Here's today's final thought. The definition of public relations is the manufacture of consent. And that's exactly what the nuclear industry is trying to do in Paris. Use the COP21 talks to manufacture consent in the entire world that nuclear truly is, and I put this in quotes, clean, green, and sustainable, to say nothing of being the savior of a planet that is facing climate change. To use a New Zealand slang term I just learned from today's guest, Kevin Hester, these billionaires promoting this agenda are spruiking speaking in public to advertise a show, promote an agenda, get your attention just like carnival barkers at a CD sideshow. Hurry, hurry, step right up and watch us con the planet out of its future while we undermine genuine renewables and make ourselves even more money. It's blackmail. They're holding out their tantalizing piles of money and promises of it, offering it to not yet nuked up nations to aid in creating what they're calling sustainable energy, as long as sustainable includes nuclear. This group of brainless billionaires call themselves the Breakthrough Energy Coalition, in the image of the so-called Breakthrough Institute that funded the lying propaganda film Pandora's Promise. 
But the necessary breakthroughs in solar and wind energy, as well as conservation and energy storage, have already taken place. We have alternative technology that works, that is proven, that is genuinely sustainable, and that creates change quickly. For example, today's story about Seoul, Korea. They've already removed the need for one nuclear reactor in just 14 months with this plan of action, renewables and conservation. Germany is going nuke-free in much the same way. It can be done. What's lacking is the will and the leadership in high places to implement this on a massive basis. It's possible. So what's stopping the world? Again, I join with Kevin Hester in citing sociopaths, psychopaths, the empathy deficient who wave in front of third world countries the hope of joining the nuclear fraternity with reactors that generate weapons-grade plutonium as part of their waste stream. I wonder what could go wrong there. I hearken back to the Greek myth of Pandora and her real promise. The nukers would like you to believe that the hope that remained at the bottom of the box that she opened is what nuclear holds for us all. What they neglect to mention is that all the evils of humanity flew out first. Envy, sickness, hate, disease, the basis of never-ending war, pain, and suffering. That is nuclear's true legacy. That is nuclear's promise. Try spruiking that at COP21, Bill Gates. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, December 8, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, safeenergy.org, theecologist.org, the Journal News, lowhud.com, krdo.com, wsbj7.com, denverpost.com, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Reuters, asahi.com, Fukushima Diary, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, abc.net.au, deckenherald.com, marianwildart.wordpress.com, Forbes.com, BeyondNuclear.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the empathy-deficient fools who write for World Nuclear News, and the Nuclear Hot Seat community on Facebook, which you are all invited to like. Thanks especially this week to the writings of Linda Penns Gunter and Michael Marriott for their insights into COP21, and we will have links to their articles up on the website NuclearHotSeat.com under this episode, number 233. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV on StuWebRadioNetwork.com, which was formerly the Veterans Truth Network, and we are syndicated in New Zealand by NewZSentinel.com. The show is also available on iTunes under Podcasts. The archive is available on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com, on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and on iTunes. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.